All right. Uh, welcome to the Bridge Podcast. I'm your host, John Lamberton. We are here for episode 54, and I'm joined by the composer Jason Eckhart. Uh, Jason is not just a composer, but also a professor of composition at uh, the SUNY Graduate Center in New York and uh, founder of Ensemble 21. And just a little additional background, um, I actually became aware of his composition through uh, his sort of passion for animal advocacy and uh, realized and also his interest in metal. So we have a lot of overlapping topics. Anyway, uh, thanks so much for joining me, Jason. Great to have you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> uh, so I, I always start these conversations off asking about people's coffee preferences or uh, if if they have coffee preferences, if not, if there's an alternative beverage that uh, they hold dear. Uh, so do you like coffee? Are you a coffee drinker? Yes, I am a coffee drinker. I don't think I'm quite as passionate um, or more meticulous about it as you are. Um, but uh, yeah, we sort of have a little coffee ritual um, that my wife and I do every morning. Um, usually uh, one of our youngest dogs needs to go out pretty early. Um, so we take her out and then my wife goes and uh, makes the coffee and then we all get in bed together and we hang out for hopefully, you know, um, an hour or maybe half an hour, depending on how early we get up. And um, that sort of gets our day started off on the right foot every day. <laughs> nice. That sounds very wholesome. Um, uh, do you, uh, do you tend to drink a lot of coffee or is it, are you a moderate drinker? I'm a moderate drinker. I uh, tend to drink probably I don't know, between 12 and 16 ounces is usually my, my, you know, uh, dosage for the day. Um, I find that if I drink coffee later in the day, it makes me really jittery. So, um, it's, it's strictly a morning thing for me. Gotcha. And, uh, I know that you don't do any dairy with it for sure, but, uh, are you a sugar or a, you know, cream type person? I uh, put a little bit of soy milk in my coffee, just a tiny bit. I tend to like dark roast coffees that um, are brewed strongly. So um, my wife makes it in the percolator um, and she's got her whole system down that I uh, tried to replicate recently and with disastrous <laughs> results. So I, I leave it to her from now on. <laughs> nice. um, I'm also glad to hear that you're a soy milk person. I feel like all the all my favorite vegans are soy milk people um, and soy milk gets a bad rap. You know, I go to Trader Joe's and literally there will be no soy milk at all um it's like what everybody's on team oat milk now and it, it irks me. <laughs> yeah oat milk's uh, probably my second choice um i don't like almond milk in coffee i have to admit that's uh that's one place that i don't like almond milk but uh but soy milk tends to be my my go-to and if i'm out and about it tends to be one that's most readily available as well very cool cool um well, the last guest I spoke to was uh, the percussionist and composer Casey Cangelosi, and he sort of uh, was using coffee as like an analogy for new music. And so he was saying, like, I know that you like Kanlan Nankaro, and you know, it's kind of an acquired taste, and people don't like black coffee from the get go, um, you know, but like once they're immersed in it, then they tend to like black coffee. And so, um, you know, your your music is certainly without sugar if we were to like describe it nutritionally um or ingredient wise and um so i'm curious you know like um since it's been described as like actively hostile to the consumer um how you think about that like um are you trying to like uh create challenging music or like is it some abstract version of beauty that you're trying to create um like how do you think about composition in that respect yeah, I mean, the, uh, the hostile consumers quote was just something funny I put on my Twitter account because it was it was written in a book and I thought, why not? <laughs> what, a, what, a, what a great scare quote. Um, but uh, for me, um, I think it's it's in two parts. I think there is a part of me that feels that um, part of what I want to do as an artist is put more beauty into the world, put more things that um, are both uh aesthetically pleasing but also challenging and um the other part of it relates to that in that i want my music to be provocative in a way um that uh as michael finnessy put it rather than placate to provoke and um that seems to be if new music has a function beyond pop music or certain pop music um that can be one really powerful avenue which it can explore interesting okay um so i mean i guess uh you know I, I've always sort of wondered why there aren't more people out there just playing C major seven chords on repeat um, because of, you know, like the sort of sugary uh, quality of that. But um, interesting. Uh, so I, I also know that you're you're very interested in like self-organization. And I'm curious, um, you know, like 
I feel like I've seen you associated with the new complexity movement. Is that something that you feel good about being associated with? Um, at this point, I'm fine with it. Um, earlier when I was starting out and, and getting a little bit of recognition, it was a little bit annoying because I think I was being cast as sort of a, you know, either an American or a ersatz version of certain composers um, associated with the new complexity movement. Um, and at that time, this is in the 90s, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, pejorative rhetoric attached to the new complexity label uh, mm -hmm. as well. And in my experience, when I when I arrived in New York City in 1992, it was a very different uh, atmosphere in terms of new music performance. Um, at that time, the two biggest new music ensembles in the city were Speculum Musicae and Bang on a Can. Uh, Speculum Musicae uh, and the people sort of around uh, that group in terms of composers and performers tended to view um, the music of say, Elliot Carter and Milton Babbitt as these sort of reasonable ceiling for complexity as, as it were in terms of performance difficulty uh, or conceptual difficulty. Um, and composers uh, like Michael Finnessy, uh, Brian Fernieho, uh, you know, Richard Barrett, James Dillon, if people had actually heard the music at all at that point, this is pre-internet, um, the uh, general um, consensus about it was that it was unnecessarily or, or almost fetishistically um, complex. Mm -hmm. um, most of the time, the people that made those uh, accusations hadn't actually heard the music in my experience because it just wasn't a lot of it available um, in commercial recordings. Um, and had had some kind of encounter with a score or seen an excerpt of a score and passed judgment uh, based on that. So I think that um, even uh, for most people, it remained a kind of straw man that, you know, needed to be taken down in order for people to, um, you know, uh, feel better about what they were doing for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, so, you know, and then there were people from completely different um, kind of aesthetic orientations that, uh, you know, just saw it as, you know, the, the latest kind of grotesque uh, iteration of, uh, you know, this uh, needless academic complexity. Gotcha. Um, that's interesting. I, uh, I guess, like, my understanding of somebody like Fernie Ho is that his music is almost aimed at being so complex that like it falls apart in the performance and that's part of the aesthetic though it seems like you get fairly accurate performances of your music do you think that's fair to say yeah i mean i think it's a little bit different in the case of brian's music um i think what he is actually aiming for is a kind of psychic stress that results in the realization of the score on the mm. performer's part so that um the energy that is transferred through that process is part and parcel part of the aesthetic um, and is not just a byproduct of it. Um, and to a certain degree, um, I find that really interesting. Um, as you said, I come from a metal background and, um, you know, for me, the kind of uh, virtuoso, virtuoso, you know, shred guitar stuff, I was a guitar player um, and uh, the intricacy of different arrangements of certain progressive metal bands, um, is something that I really liked for a long time before I even knew contemporary music. So that sense of the virtuosity, um, not necessarily in a Listian 19th century sense, but rather related to that uh, kind of metal. And they, they are related, um, you know, you have plenty of, you know, guitar players that were playing Paganini etudes and things like that, mm -hmm. um, uh, and probably still are. Um, but uh, there is a kind of sense of, of mastery and virtuosity in that sense, which I do embody in my music. Um, and the, in the technical nuts and bolts of how my music is notated specifically, um, I do try and take into account um, in great deal the types of ways in which performers learn and rehearse music. Um, this, this came purely out of my experience of not only working with performers, but also running an ensemble, um, Ensemble 21, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And one of the uh, most instructive things that I learned uh, from that experience was when I would go to rehearsals of not my music, where the composer was not present and heard the musicians rehearse and looked at what worked and what didn't, uh, what raised questions, what was fairly clear. That was an incredible education um, and something that taught me a great deal about not just score preparation, um, but also 
thinking about ways in which musicians learn and rehearse that would make my music easier to realize despite the surface level of, of, of frenzy or rhythmic complexity. Um, so for example, um, most of my scores are in triple time and three eight. That's not because I'm some, you know, deep uh, fan of uh, waltzes or something like that. But it's uh, really just because for one thing, that format just fits well on my computer screen and no other reason. Um, and I tend to let the rhythm do the heavy lifting as opposed to uh, the meters and tempo changes. Um, so in my scores, you'll see the beats usually very clearly denotated um, in the notation, uh, but the rhythms um, themselves are not reflecting that background um, pulse grid of the, of the meter. Mm -hmm. So uh, even though it's not discernible on the surface, um, the musicians can see that very clearly. Um, and especially with ensembles that are unconducted, um, the ability for musicians to get back on track should they get off is usually fairly quick. Um, and uh, as a result, um, speaking with musicians and working with them for a long time, they, they tend to learn my music a little bit faster and retain it a little bit more easier and integrate that into rehearsals a little bit more smoothly than, than some other music, which uh, features consistently shifting meters, consistently shifting tempi and things like that. Um, there's music that's written that way that I love. Uh, everything from, you know, uh, uh, from Boulez to Roger Redgate, um, but um, they're is for me a kind of practical sense that I can make my music work um, in this way. And if I can make that easier for performers and get more accurate performances that are closer to what my mental image of that music is, then for me, that's, 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 a, that's the goal. Interesting. Um, it, so actually, I, I had some sort of specific notation questions that I wrote down. And one is um, basically, like, I, I noticed that you seem to use your reference pulse often as an eighth note. I come from this world where I just like assume everybody's going to reference a quarter note as their tempo or maybe a dotted quarter or something like that. But um, I'm just curious if that's something that you consciously thought about, because like in my mind, I'd, I don't know what benefit it would, it would offer to have the eighth note be the reference. But maybe that's just my own sort of preconceived notion of what's you know reasonable. Um, what's what's uh, going on there? Yeah, so um, when I started to encounter um, certain scores, uh, mainly European scores, um, when I was uh, when I was in graduate school, I started to notice that people were using smaller subdivisions in the quarter note as the as the background pulse. And I think in the case of certain new complexity composers, that was um, part of the notation, just uh, looking intimidating and and. You know, in the case of, uh, of Fernio's music, um, you know, kind of feeding into this uh, performance anxiety, which is part of that energy, which is generated from the realization. Um, and uh, I have to admit, I was I was attracted to that as an interesting idea, but it also has a very practical application for me, and that is that um, the more uh, beams that you have on a um, on a figure, um, the more that you can break those beams. Okay. So. Um, a lot of times you'll have uh, tuplets inside of tuplets um, in my music. And if I break the beams where those tuplets change, so if I have a triplet inside a triplet um, where the second triplet enters, I would break the beam on the second triplet. Um, that's a visual cue for the performer that something is changing. Okay. Um, so for me, it also played into the, uh, the performance aspect of the way that the score looks and the cues that are being given to the performer in order to try and realize it with as much accuracy as possible. Interesting. Okay. That makes sense. Um, the other thing is, and this is sort of um, something that I started thinking about because of looking at your scores, but um, I'm curious if you have a, an answer for this. Um, so like I, I had avoided learning what dotted, like, oh, sorry, double dotted notes meant like what that conversion was. But um I, I generally think of the dotted pulse to be like sort of uh, like the reflection of a triplet, like, uh, you know, like a triplet quarter note is essentially going 50% faster while a dotted quarter note is going, it's 50% longer. And so there's like a sort of utonal, uh, otonal type of relationship there. But um, with the double dotted, it took me a while to like really figure out what was going on. And I only had to uh, engage with it when I was looking at your scores. But um in my mind, that's sort of a reflection of a septuplet because it's, you know, um, like you could fill uh, a bar of 716 with a double dotted quarter note, right? Mm -hmm. 
Um, so, you know, and then when you go to triple dotted, it's essentially 1532. So uh, do you feel like there's something in notation that's missing out on the ability to, with one note, fill up a bar of five units? Um, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, honestly, if, if if I were notating it that way, I would definitely break it up into parts. So if it was okay. a seven sixteen, um, uh, you know, for example, or seven eight uh, measure, um, you know, more or less everything is broken down into groups of two and three, right? Mm -hmm. So um, it would either be in this case like three plus four or three plus two plus two, or um, or uh, two plus two plus three. Um, you know, if sometimes if it, if it gets a little weird, if it's like two plus three plus two, then I might reflect that actually in the, in the time signature, um, or I might break that up into smaller measures, depending on, you know, what, what's going on and, and maybe not everyone is subdividing into that, um, uh, into those groups simultaneously. So you could have, you know, a, a seven, eight where, you know, somebody's four plus three and another person's three plus four or some combination of that. I try to reflect that as much as I can. And, um, in the notation. So instead of uh, writing a single value uh, for, you know, uh, a 716 bar, I'd write, you know, a dotted eighth and, um, you know, and, uh, and a quarter. And then that way, um, especially if the piece is conducted and there's a general um, pulse which is being reflected by the conductor, then the performers can see that the notation reflects the gesture that the conductor is making. Um, okay. Even sometimes if um, the performer might not necessarily be phrasing as say three plus four, I might still notate it that way so that in the subdivision, they can see how they relate to the conductor because that's the beat that they're gonna follow. If it's not conducted and the overwhelming um, sort of, uh, you know, uh, majority of the group are playing say, uh, three plus four, then I still, and, and someone's not playing that subdivision, I still might notate it that way. So the whole group can feel that measure together. Um, even if they're contradicting in terms of phrasing or duration or whatever, um, the, uh, that, that particular subdivision, um, if everyone's feeling that at the same way together, I think that there's a much greater chance of success and coordination than the other way around. Gotcha. It's a sort of pedantic question, but um, I, I found myself uh, really wrestling with why I can't have one uh, sort of, you know, note fill up a, a bar of five. <laughs> um, anyway, um, so, um, you know, I read in your bio that um, you're interested in like the self-organization, self-organizing principles in nature. And um, so I'm curious, like, to what degree is your music sort of self-organizing? Um, and I mean, like, you know, it, it makes me think of this distinction between complicated and complex that I've heard people make where um, complicated sort of requires like, you know, this fragile like negotiation uh, that requires expertise while complexity is a little bit more like you have to probe and it's more about like, you know, sort of like layered and stacking dynamical uh, forces. So um, what, to what degree are you sort of self-organizing in your music? So, um, I mean, really, that is more of a metaphorical relationship to me. Um, I mean, I'm not using complexity science to generate, you know, forms or, um, you know, processes in my music. Um, but I see them as related in my mind, at least in an interesting way. So in a, a self-organizing system, you have several elements um, which are coalescing together to kind of find a sense of equilibrium, you know, and that can be, you know, uh, anything from, uh, you know, a, a drop of water to a tornado, um, you know, or, or anything beyond that scope. Um, and that, that sort of uh, sense of equilibrium that's being struck is usually because there's uh, all kinds of competing forces which are coming into alignment with one another to strike that balance, whatever it is. Um, and that can, of course, be disrupted in all kinds of ways um, by, uh, you know, some sort of you know, weather event or, uh, you know, uh, you know, invasive species coming into an ecosystem or, or something like that. Um, so for me, um, you know, I don't organize uh, my pieces in terms of their form or content uh, a priori. It's always based on uh, certain small ideas that then grow into much larger complex um, holes. So um, usually for me, it's it's about how all of these sort of micro movements or micro elements sort of coordinate together to form something larger. And I don't necessarily know what that's going to be at the beginning of a piece. 
Um, usually I have a, a, you know, an idea for a beginning of a piece, which could just be, you know, some sort of gesture. Um, and uh, then exploding that out into much larger uh, structures uh, based on what I think the implications of the, of the, of the gesture or whatever it is itself um, have for me, then um, I'm able to kind of create these larger forms, which hopefully feel um, like there's some sort of underlying relationship. I, I hesitate to use the word organic, but, um, but hopefully there's some sort of sense of belonging amongst elements, even if those elements seem at uh, first listen to be, you know, wildly divergent um, and juxtaposing to one another. Interesting. Um, would it be fair to say that the process is sort of more bottom up than top down? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, I've, I've written a couple of pieces that were kind of more top down pieces. Um, I, I mean, you know, over 20 years ago, and I, I really wanted to try writing that way. And I did it. It was painful. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, 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 I'm not unhappy with the results of the piece, but it, it was very clear to me that this wasn't a very effective way of me working. Um, so it's definitely very bottom up. And um, I'm always interested in the hierarchical structures that um, are created um, by the, the kind of constant spinning out of these ideas, but um, they're only understood, at least by me, and I think by listeners as well, um, in retrospect. Um, they're not uh, these uh, these kind of preconceived forms in which the content is being um, derived um, at smaller and smaller, smaller levels. It's, it's the opposite. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, another sort of specific question about uh, your approach here. Uh, do you have a final duration in mind when you start a piece or does it sort of happen to be whatever it happens to be? I have a rough idea. And again, that's related to the uh, sort of material that I start with. Um, I mean, sometimes, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's the ensemble or sense of occasion or something like that. You know, um, if I'm starting, uh, you know, a piece, uh, say for, uh, you know, solo oboe, um, you know, maybe immediately the place I'm not going to go, is this going to be a, you know, 75 minute work, <laughs> um, you know, um, but usually, Usually uh, for me, it has to do with the material itself and the implications of that material um, that I think uh, it has over time. So for instance, when you listen to the beginning of, I don't know, Mahler 9 or, um, you know, the German Requiem or something like that, you know that you're in for a while, you know, this isn't going to be, um, you know, uh, something that's going to be over in five minutes. Um, the material itself and the pacing, um, especially in those works, um, suggest a certain duration um, and imply that um, just at the at the start. Um, so for me, it's uh, thinking in part about, you know, sort of generally, you know, how long do I think a piece like this you know, could be. Um, and secondly, um, and most importantly, sort of what the material I kind of come up with initially for that piece is and what the implications for um, its possible uh, duration um, in terms of the whole piece might be. Interesting. And so um, when you get like a commission, that's not sort of the defining, is that ever the defining, uh, you know, aspect of what would make it, you know, a given duration? I have had definitely commissions where people, you know, sort of have said, you know, we want it, you know, between this and this, um, you know, and, you know, that's, it's usually reasonable. And uh, if someone's going to commission me and go to the trouble of getting the money together and everything, I mean, they, they know my music, presumably, mm -hmm. and they know, um, you know, what, uh, what I do. So, you know, they probably won't, you know, ask for a four hour piece. Um, you know, or, or, you know, a two minute piece for orchestra or something like that. Um, you know, they're, they're hopefully, you know, have some idea. I mean, certainly with institutions um, that, that grant uh, commissions um, and however that process works, I don't know, but sometimes it's been clear that maybe they aren't quite as familiar with my music as, um, as someone like an ensemble or a soloist who, um, you know, specifically approaches me. Um, but, uh, but rarely has that ever been a problem for me, uh, because my pieces don't tend to be extremely short or extremely long. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Um, let's see here. Um, I, I sort of was expecting that you were a top-down composer, so I'm a little <laughs> bit surprised by this. Um, uh, let's see here. So um, I know that, uh, you know, 
you know, your bio says that you were like very into metal. And then upon hearing Weyburn, it sort of made you commit to um, being a composer. Um, would you say that Weyburn and Babbitt and Carter are all sort of in the same like uh, level of your uh, influences or is Weyburn like specifically your guy? Well, Weyburn was the, was the gateway. Um, you know, I mean, there were, there were people who provided keys to me, um, you know, uh, I would have to go back to saying that, you know, Zappa was extremely influential in me thinking about, you know, possibilities of musical organization um, when I was young that um, I, you know, I don't think I would have come across naturally uh, any other way, at least in my personal situation. Um, the first time I heard Stravinsky was actually on a Zappa mother's bootleg from 1968, I believe, or 67. Um, it was an arrangement of a, a segment of Petrushka. Um, and I was like, well, what's this? This is interesting. Who's Stravinsky, you know? Um, so uh, through Zappa, I got interested in Stravinsky and some other composers like Bartok um, and uh, Prokofiev. Um, and uh, it wasn't until I was uh, older, um, when I was about, I'd say maybe 19 or something like that, that I, that I discovered Bayburn um, on the advice of uh, a teacher that I had um, in music school. Um, I had been in a theory class and a counterpoint class, actually. Um, and um, I had asked him, you know, about 12 tone music because I really didn't know what it was. And uh, he had suggested listening to Schoenberg and, and, and Bayburn first. Um, so, uh, so uh, ironically, the first Schoenberg piece that I heard uh, was for Clare <laughs> and I naively believed that that was <laughs> that was twelve tone music, and kind of you know kind of set it aside. And I, at that point in my life, I was really looking for something different. Um, and then uh, I put the Webern recording on that I had, I had bought, and that was not a twelve tone piece, but it was the Opus Five pieces for string quartet, which exhibit a lot of the kinds of ways in which Webern was thinking about um, gesture and harmony um, that were later um, refined in the twelve tone music. Um, so that was a, a completely revelatory experience for me. It was completely different than any other music I'd heard in terms of its expressive power and concision and uh, its, uh, you know, uh, its structural integrity. I just never heard something that was so immediately striking in those ways. Um, so that was precisely the point when I decided I don't want to play guitar anymore. I want to learn how to do this and I need to uh, and I need to figure out how. <laughs> um, and uh, Babbitt and Carter uh, came a little later. Uh, Carter didn't come much later. Um, I think the first two recordings of Living Composers I, uh, I bought was uh, the Carter Piano Concerto uh, and Variations for Orchestra and Boulez Plis Sol en Plis. And I was lucky because, I mean, at that point, I was just going to Tower Records and just looking at cd covers i had no idea what this music <laughs> sounded like and just like okay this 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 one looks good you know um just kind of randomly taking home these recordings um uh to listen to and um i was i was fortunate that i picked two really good ones um and those particularly the piano concerto and please sell on plea still remain to me uh some of my favorite works uh by those composers some of my favorite works of the 20th century um, and that kind of sent me on my way. Um, I was living in Boston at the time. And uh, one of the things that also was really um, uh, inspiring and also surprising to me uh, was the fact that people like Carter and Babbitt were just around. You could just go and talk to them at concerts. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, it was it was not a big deal um, just to approach them and have a conversation. Um, and uh, Babbitt came a little bit later for me. Um, but uh, when it did, it was at a very good time because I was just starting to get really serious about composition. And um, he uh, actually was a hugely open and inviting person and became a mentor to me. Um, oh. So the timing really, really worked out uh, for me at that point. And also just the good luck of the fact that my parents lived in Princeton and so did he. So um, when I went home on a, on a Thanksgiving break from, from music school, I, uh, I had seen him at a concert and asked if I, you know, could meet with him. And he said, sure. And, um, we met and, uh, immediately I thought I would just kind of be getting like some compositional advice for him, but he was much more interested in me and what I was doing and, uh, asked me what I wanted to do at that point. My biggest goal was to get into graduate school. Um, so he spent 
over an hour with me just going through all the different programs and all the different people and wow. who I should talk to, um, who would be interesting to study with, and really giving me a lot more than just your pieces are nice and, um, you know, good job. Keep, keep at it. Um, it was, it was a really, really invaluable, uh, session. And, and, you know, from that point on, he remained a, a very, very powerful mentor. And I'm happy to say we, we became friends as well. Wow. Um, I'm, I'm jealous. <laughs> um, that, that's awesome. Uh, let's see here. Um, man, uh, that's, that's, uh, yeah, that's, that's crazy. Uh, I guess uh, that made me distracted from what I was going to ask next, but um, uh, let's see here. Uh, uh, so, I mean, I guess like uh, for me, the the Webern of my sort of musical background is probably more Carter. And um, I'm curious, you know, uh, like you seem very interested in atonality and, uh, you know, microtonality as well. And actually I've, you know, interviewed a ton of microtonal people and like, I've almost sort of like, developed this aversion to sort of the religious quality of microtonal uh, people where like you know they're like kind of like i worship the overtone series and just intonations better than uh, any temperament and they sort of like have some issue with logarithmic division of the octave but um what's your relationship with that like uh because uh, it seems like the way that you engage with microtonality isn't in a just intonation way whatsoever and um, like, how do you think about, you know, that spectrum of atonality to microtonality and sort of, you know, uh, you know, set theory versus, you know, 12 tone uh, sort of like, you know, tried and true, uh, you know, democratic distribution of <laughs> that. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, for, for whatever Schoenberg or his followers said, um, you know, the, the 12-tone system was never democratic. There was there were always despots um, embedded in the in the in the population. Um, but uh, for me, uh, again, it came back to kind of more just a personal practical experience um, in that um, equal divisions of the octave, um, particularly quarter tones versus semitones, was just something that for me was easier to hear mm -hmm. and um, that I could train myself to do. Um, there weren't really, um, you know, by the time I moved to New York and got interested in this stuff, um, there weren't really people at, at least where I was, um, who were doing any kind of microtonality. Um, and, um, you know, when I tried to press, uh, you know, one of my teachers about it, um, you know, he, uh, brought in, um, an expert in Harry Parch, which is really cool, but had nothing to do with, <laughs> you know, what, what, what I was doing. Um, so, I think that um, for one thing, there was uh, just a completely kind of black hole for me in microtonality. I had to kind of just figure it out by looking at other scores and just kind of training myself to hear these intervals. So for me, um, you know, who was brought up in a sort of solfege, you know, kind of, um, you know, semitonal world, subdividing into quarter tones just made a lot of sense. Mm -hmm. And I could actually practice intervals, you know, with a keyboard in my, in my, apartment and I could learn, you know, those intervals. And to this day, those are so sort of burned into my psyche. Um, while I find a lot of uh, music that is not uh, derived that way, that is microtonal, incredibly beautiful and, and, and uh, moving and powerful, um, it's just not a kind of way I hear. Um, so uh, when I've worked with students who are working with those systems, it's been a real challenge for me because uh, that's just, uh, it's just a kind of hearing that I'm not I'm not adept at. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so for me, um, it's always been about equal subdivisions of the octave, quarter tones, occasionally um, moving into eighth tones, um, but those are really more inflectional um, and uh, rather than structural, uh, the way the quarter tones are. Um, so when I started working with them, I was coming from a very kind of 12 tone set theory background. And I just started to make sort of, you know, modulo 24 sets um, and just applying all of the set theory stuff um, that I had uh, learned to that. And um, quickly I started to learn that, um, you know, uh, just like I was alluding to before, you know, not everything's created equal. <laughs> so um, for me in my own hearing, um, when microtonal intervals were uh, created through intervals, semitonal intervals that were modified that were perfect intervals. So say an octave lowered by a quarter tone or an eighth tone or a fifth lowered by a quarter tone or an eighth tone. Um, those tended to, for me at least, to kind of lock into those, um, uh, to those perfect intervals. So I'd kind of hear it more like an out of tone 
out of tune fifth or an out of tune octave. Whereas um, imperfect intervals like uh, sixth and thirds, um, for example, um, those seem to have really independent and distinct identities to me. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, not that I have completely avoided using those intervals in, in, in my music, um, uh, these perfect intervals that are modified, but the overwhelming majority of time it has always been these imperfect intervals. Um, and I think that has to do not only just with, you know, my own um, kind of predilections or limitations, but I suspect it also has a lot to do with the overtone series and, and the way that Western instruments are tuned as well. Gotcha. Interesting. Um... So when you when you mentioned, uh, you know, sort of like the bottom up uh, process that you do and, you know, how you might take a gesture and sort of explode it out. Um, can you give me a sense of what that might look like on a practical level of uh, sort of like, you know, taking that gesture and expanding on it? Sure. So um, usually, um, you know, things start with some idea, um, you know, it could be a lick, it could be a chord. I mean, usually it's some sort of gesture. I mean, I'm a very gestural composer. I think that comes straight out of being a guitar player and just playing licks all the time, you know. <laughs> um, so, uh, so usually, uh, you know, I have some idea for the beginning of the piece. Um, I can't really start the piece proper until I know what the beginning of the piece is, because for one thing, uh, the whole process I'm about to describe depends on it. And secondly, I always start at the beginning of pieces and just write them from beginning to end left to right. I don't jump around or, or put together different sections or things like that. I, I have very early on, but not for you know decades, have I have I you know tried to write music like that. It just doesn't doesn't work for me. Um, so what I'll do is I'll usually come up with some sort of gesture, um, which may or may not have a certain level of detail. It could be very rough. It could be fairly detailed. And I'll just, you know, I'll just write that out. Um, and then uh, I'll spend a lot of time sort of dissecting that gesture or that idea and looking at all its component parts and seeing what that those parts suggest to me, um, not just in terms of, say, um, linear variation, um, but also in terms of harmony, in terms of an overall durational structure to get back to what we talked about earlier, um, you know, different types of instrumental possibilities for realization, although usually um, um, the instrumental realization and the gestures themselves are, are completely interfused. Um, and uh, I, I don't write, you know, in short score, or just kind of abstractly and then kind of orchestrate. It's, everything's sort of fully orchestrated from, from the beginning. Okay. Um, so, uh, so what I do is sort of build a kind of um, a, uh, a kind of, uh, you know, database of information um, with whatever that, that, that gesture is. And then I start to look at ways in which that has capabilities for different types of processes to develop. Um, so, for example, um, if the gesture uh, has a certain kind of harmony, you know, what are the possibilities for harmonies um, that uh, would complement that? Or could I create other versions of those harmonies uh, which maintain the same interval structure but don't share any common tones, for example? So I can keep, you know, a very uh, chromatic surface without it necessarily having to be aggregate forming or 12 tone. Okay. Um, you know, what's the registration? Um, if the register is very compact, does that suggest that it needs to expand outward? Um, if the registration is very disparate, does it need to compress? Um, you know, um, are there holes in that registration? Is that is that something that I can um, use as uh, a kind of poignant absence to uh, to fill in later at a, at a very vital point? Um, you know, what are the rhythmic possibilities? Um, is it is it a single rhythmic idea? Are there sub rhythms within it? Are there changes in speed? Um, you know, are there different articulations that are that are possible? Or is it one sort of articulation? Um, all of these things, um, you know, tend to uh, be the kinds of uh, things that I put in this database and um, start to explore possibilities with. And I'm always a really big fan of creating these kind of databases or, or reservoirs of information, which I can refer to later. So that when I'm sort of uh, in the heat of battle of composition, I don't have to kind of stop and be like, okay, well, you know, can I actually transpose this and have like two common tones or something like that, you know, mm -hmm. or, or, you know, will this actually work on the violin versus uh, the flute? Um, you know, those kinds of things I'd like to really explore uh, before I uh, get started on like putting notes on the, on the page of the score um, to have uh, a way of quickly 
uh, answering questions that I might have along the way, as opposed to having to stop the flow of creativity and then go back and figure out what I need to do and then return, because that's uh, just a less efficient way of, of going about it for me. Interesting. Okay. Um, so, uh, you know, since I know that you teach composition as well as doing it yourself, um, I'm curious, sort of like, you don't seem like the type of teacher who would impose too much of your own process or stylistic considerations on a student. Is that fair to say? Yeah, um, <laughs> and that, that comes definitely from from personal experience, too. Um, I had a composition teacher once whose music I revered greatly, um, and uh, he more or less wanted to make me into a miniature version of himself to the point where I would bring in scores and he would just, you know, write on them and kind of correct them and 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 make them you know the way that he wanted to them hand them back to me you know say make these corrections and you know bring in what you've got next week um and that was a very difficult um time for me and i even considered you know stopping lessons with this person because it was just a very difficult process for me and i felt i was losing a lot of my own creative identity as a result but i stuck with it and um I don't know if it had anything to do with it or it was just a coincidence, but the piece that I wrote after that time that I studied with that person um, was a huge sort of leap forward for me. So maybe there was something that was just, you know, um, being absorbed in me through the things that he was saying, because he had a lot of really interesting things to say, um, you know, or I was just finally like, you know, I've been freed and now I can do whatever I want and, uh, you know, kind of went in a completely different direction. Um, but uh from my point of view, a composition teacher is, or at least the composition teacher that I want to be, is someone who uh, allows the student to realize with the most effectiveness and efficiency the sonic thing, the sonic images that they have in their mind. And if I can help them do that, um, then I feel like I've been successful. Um, you know, I, I don't try and, uh, you know, suggest anything beyond uh, some listening ideas that a, a student should do in their piece or not do in their piece in terms of style, aesthetic, technique, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've always believed that, uh, you know, whatever gets you through the night is what is right for you. And um, if, you know, that means something completely different than what I do, um, that's absolutely fine. And in the overwhelming majority of cases, um, students have completely different ways of working than I do. And sometimes that can be a challenge because, you know, I try to, you know, maybe it's inevitable that I always relate everything back to myself, you know, um, as how I sort of see music and, and how I'm trying to uh, help this uh, student composer. But um, I really feel that um, imposing anything uh, beyond just, you know, some mild suggestions um, is, is really kind of counterintuitive. Um, obviously, if there are young composers who um, really need a lot of uh, help with technique and things like that, some much more prescriptive types of suggestions can be really helpful. Uh, but for composers who are, um, you know, finding uh, their voice and have a certain degree of artistic maturity, I really feel that um, I need to let them steer the ship and I will just, uh, you know, provide a few uh, possible routes uh, through the uh, through the channel for them to to consider. Gotcha. Um, I guess, like, you know, if I've like I've been looking around for uh, various grad schools and like sometimes seeing the faculty and like hearing their music, I'm like, this person like has a gig teaching other people how to do this and like um you know and then i'm like well is this just my preference maybe i don't get their music but um i'm curious how do you like evaluate uh sort of the quality of somebody's compositional technique independent of sort of stylistic preferences if that makes yeah sense. well to, to, before i answer that just to get back to something that you that you mentioned earlier i i, I also know that um from personal experience that necessarily not the best composition teachers are the best composers <laughs> gotcha um, so, uh, you know, I, uh, uh, I also think that sometimes composers who have no stylistic overlap, um, with you can be great 
composers to study with. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for instance, um, uh, Jonathan Kramer was a huge influence on my composition and was a, my composition teacher for uh, for a few years when I was in um, graduate school. Uh, his music and my music, um, at least at the time that I was writing and what he was writing at the time, really were coming from completely different places in terms of technique, in terms of aesthetic, in terms of the philosophical underpinnings of what was interesting about music. Um, but he was an incredible composition teacher for me. And um, he was incredibly open-minded, but also completely rigorous. Um, so I could bring in the craziest idea I could think of, and he would take it deadly seriously. So, you know, I mean, I could literally come in and say, you know, I want to write this piece for trombone and bathtub. And he'd be like, what are the dimensions of the bathtub? <laughs> you know, <laughs> how is a bathtub oriented relation to the audience? Like, you know, I mean, and just, and just break it down. And he would just cut through my BS, you know, like, uh, like a samurai. And, um, you know, he was, uh, you know, really able to make me really, really commit to the things that I wanted to do um, without trying to, you know, halfway any idea or, uh, or fudge anything. Um, and that was incredibly, um, incredibly helpful to me as a composer, but also provided a great model for me as a teacher. So um, even though I, I, I love his music, um, not to say that um, he doesn't write good music, but um, him and I were coming from completely different places, but he was a great composition teacher for me. And I think there are some people that uh, you know, whose music, um, you know, may not uh, be in the pantheon of, uh, you know, uh, what people consider to be great, you know, contemporary composers or composers of the 20th century who were nevertheless, you know, great teachers. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't always feel like there's, there, there's uh, quite a connection there. Uh, ironically, most people get composition jobs, at least at higher levels, because they're, you know, sort of famous or semi-famous composers and that mm -hmm. reputation allows them to uh, sort of be in the running for for composition jobs um, what little there are of them left <laughs> um, but to get back to the question that you asked earlier um, about how do I assess a composer's technique it, again it's really just um, you know how well are you realizing the thing that you want to do and sometimes composers are really uh, challenge to even articulate what it is exactly they want to do, um, or maybe they don't quite know yet what they want to do, or have some semblance of it, or might be really established in a certain kind of music, um, and, um, you know, are, are looking to move to, or at least expand to, um, you know, a different kind of composition um, that they would study with me for. So, um, you know, in a case like that, for example, you know, I might have someone who is a brilliant improviser, and really talk to them about that, um, and talk to them about um, you know, what is it that, um, you know, is, is driving your decisions, uh, you know, as an improviser, you know, um, or if someone has a certain level of expertise uh, in another kind of music, um, you know, uh, I might really kind of mind them for that and be like, okay, well, you know, is, is there a translation between the things that you're interested there and the things that you're interested in here? Um, and by sort of uh, trying to analyze, you know, in part by what the composer says and also sort of just looking at their compositions, I try to figure out what they're really trying to do and then try to give them the tools to do that. So um, some composers, uh, um, you know, have a very, very sophisticated and well-tuned uh, engine to realize those ideas. Um, I remember having a student once who uh, was, was just brilliant in the sense that he could do anything that he wanted to. And I kept trying to throw roadblocks in front of him and I kept asking him to do crazier and crazier things. And he would come in and he would do it. I just be like, oh, this kid is just too talented. You know, he could just kind of do anything. Um, you know, he had other, I think, issues that, you know, he kind of, because he could do anything, you know, I think he had a hard time kind of focusing on what he did want to do. Um, you know, uh, so, so that, that for me was really the challenge with him to really sort of, uh, force him to focus on what he really wanted to do after I uh, figured out that, you know, there wasn't anything that he couldn't do, and at least that I, I could think of. Um, so, so that kind of technical underpinning is really just a tool for realization. So if a student can do that, um, and they're writing music that sounds good to them and that they're happy with, then I don't really think that, uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, more to it than that. Um, of course, you know, there's other things that they can learn to do outside of themselves um, that may be interesting to them that we can explore together. Um, but in, in terms of just pure technique, it's really just the ability to, to realize those ideas um, in a tangible way outside of themselves and their imagination. 
Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, so I guess um, I'm, you know, I'm sort of in the midst of like looking at grad schools and um, trying to, you know, find a place that looks right for me. Uh, is there any advice that you would give in terms of uh, finding a good grad school, finding a, a mentor that you like, or like making sure that once you're in grad school that you get the most out of it? Yeah, well, I mean, I think the first thing that you want to ask is, why am I going to grad school? You know, like, mm -hmm. what am I, what am I, what's the end goal here? Um, you know, I don't know how many people say this these days, but for a long time, um, you know, a lot of people would say, well, I want to teach. Well, there are no teaching jobs. So, um, <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Um, you know, um, you know, some people feel that, you know, they just don't have the amount of experience or technique or, or whatever, um, that would allow them to be successful as, as a composer. And they want to hone those skills, whatever they are uh, at, um, at school. Um, and I think that's a, that's a very noble um, thing to do. Um, so I think the first thing that one wants to ask is, you know, why am I, why am I doing this? Um, and, you know, as an adjunct to that, I would say, you know, um, you know, no matter what your decision is, uh, and no matter what your answer to that question is, don't put yourself in debt doing it. <laughs> you know, yeah. we're, we're, not, we're not stepping into, you know, six figure salaries um, straight out of school as in some other professions. Um, and for people who come out of school with six figure debts, that's, that can be something that can be a burden for the rest of your life. Yeah. Um, and uh, that's something to very, very, very seriously think about. Um, I think that, um, you know, in terms of thinking about what you uh, what would be a good good fit for you? Um, one of the things that I suggest is not only talking to the faculty, but also talking to the students mm -hmm. and actually getting on campus if you can. Um, sit in on a class, um, you know, uh, talk to people there. The students have a completely different viewpoint than the faculty do, and I know this as a faculty member that you know there are ways students because something students tell me I'm like really is that is that what how people feel about you know this thing, <laughs> and um, you know sometimes it's very surprising to me, um, or sometimes I think you know the students are going to love this. This is a great opportunity for them, and the reception is lukewarm, and it's like well you know, what do you want, you know, like, tell, tell me, you know, what, what you need. Um, so talking to the students about their experience there is, is really, really important. Um, you know, there may be, for example, a, a very well-known composer who's teaching on a campus um, that you want to study with, and the student might tell you, well, you know, they're here, like, once a month, and they don't really teach, and, you know, you probably won't be able to work with that person much. Um, right. So, uh, so, you know, um, you know, that, that might be a deciding factor in, um, you know, whether you apply to that school or whether you accept a, an offer from that school. Um, you know, other things that are practical in terms of what's important to you for most students, uh, performance opportunities are a big thing. So uh, depending on whether you apply to a conservatory type uh, school or a university type school, uh, those can be really different. Um, at a conservatory, you have um, peers who uh, you can tap um, to play your music, which can be really, really valuable in that um, you can form peer groups that um, are evolving uh, simultaneously and uh, are hopefully uh, in for long-term relationships as opposed to the usual situation um, at music department um, type uh, programs, which, you know, you might have a famous ensemble come in and they might do a great performance of your piece, you're recording your piece, and then, you know, and then they're gone. Um, you know, uh, what you want uh, out of that is really, you know, uh, a good question. Um, you know, uh, having high quality recordings of your work is extremely important, um, you know, uh, especially for young, young composers. Um, so having, you know, a great ensemble come in or soloists come in and record your music and having a stellar recording could be a really, really valuable thing. Um, simultaneously building a relationship over a long term uh, with peer group, uh, you know, performers and other composers uh, can be a really good thing, whether you form an ensemble together or just have a long working relationship. Um, you know, those things are, are all things to consider. Um, and uh, I also think that um, just the general culture of the place um, is something to consider. 
um, you know, some people would be happy, um, you know, in a fairly isolated campus um, in a non-urban area. Um, some people really need to be in a very um, uh, active cultural um, kind of environment um, with regard to uh, urban areas and opportunities that those afford. Um, you know, and but there's trade-offs with expense, for example. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the things that's uh, very forbidding about New York City is is the the cost of living there, um, and it's uh, it's and it's a huge you know issue for for people, um, you know, uh, both students and and professionals um, trying to eke out their living. So uh, you know, all of these things um, you know uh, come into play, and there's no one size fits all. Um, although you know, students think, oh, if I just get into a good school, <laughs> you know, I'll be I'll, I'll be all set. And, um, you know, while there is some truth to the fact that, you know, if you get into a top rung school, you are sort of getting exposed to a certain, uh, a certain peer group and a certain number of opportunities uh, due to the school's prestige and the amount of money the school has to spend on things like this. Um, you know, it may not be a good fit for people um, and you might be miserable there if, mm -hmm. if, if the culture and the location and the faculty and the other students uh, don't really don't really click with you. So, um, you know, as much as you can, I would say, uh, just get really hands on experience with what it's like to be in those places and see if that seems like a good fit for you beyond just I love this composer's music and I really want to study with them. Excellent. Cool. Um... Well, the last thing I'll ask about is, uh, I guess, about sort of like your interest in animal advocacy, because that's something that I'm also very interested in. And um, to give you a little bit of context, like, I guess, um, you know, when I was asking about what your sort of utility function is as a composer earlier, like, is it you know, bringing in beauty? Is it bringing in complexity? Um, something that I feel like I wrestled with for a while is like, you know, sort of like if you ask the standard musician, why do you do this? It's you might get a cliche answer like oh it's because i can't not do it or like i have to or you know whatever and that's fine if that's the answer but i'm i'm not convinced by that and so like as like a, a big peter singer head personally um or like you know like you read the interview with uh, brian tomasic like um i feel like these sort of concrete um altruistic causes are very important to me but like at the same time uh you know like is it better for the lawyer to donate a bunch of money to a soup kitchen or is it better for him to spend an hour there, you know, doling out soup himself? Um, and so like, in some way I'm like, whatever impact uh, I could have in this way is kind of limited by being a niche composer, um, you know, and like, granted, I'm not gonna go into investment banking just so that I can, uh, you know, make a bigger impact. It's not even in my skill set, but, um, I guess, like, how, how does uh, your work as a composer interact with sort of your more altruistic or political interests? Yeah, well, that's an interesting question. And, and, and getting back to what you were, uh, you know, uh, saying before, uh, you know, about the investment banker uh, either donating or working in the soup kitchen, um, you know, this, this is a kind of dilemma that I've had in the past myself. And the easy answer is, why can't you do both? Mm. Um, you know, um, the dilemma for me arose um, in the uh, the first Gulf War um, uh, after the invasion, and I started to realize that um, I'm sorry, the second Gulf War, and I started to realize that um, you know you know my music like what am I doing you know I'm, I'm writing this esoteric music mm -hmm. that's heard by you know a few hundred people and um, you know is, is not going to change the world so why am I even bothering with that so uh, my answer to that was to stop composing actually and, and mm -hmm. dedicate myself more to political action um, and uh, you know as I was doing that and sort of struggling with you know where my place in the world would be um, I started to realize two things. One, as I said, I can do both. There's, there's no conflict there for me. Um, and secondly, um, you know, if music or art generally wasn't an absolutely necessary part of civilization, it would have disappeared a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it doesn't have a, a utility in that sense, you know. Um, so I think that as much as I admire Peter Singer, and I think aspects of utilitarianism are very, very useful, um, especially in the practical sense of just making decisions about effectiveness of one's actions, um, there is another part of, of being a human being, um, which uh, is not easily uh, boiled down to utilitarian um, black or white um, types of uh, decisions that one can make, and that um, by 
engaging with political issues in my music, for example, uh, which I never did before this point, um, the point that I mentioned earlier, um, I wasn't just trying to you know, jump on the bandwagon or make my music more relevant or, or something like that. It mm -hmm. was about, um, for me, uh, in those pieces uh, and continuing uh, in pieces that some of the pieces that are right now, to try and create an environment in which someone interacts with that subject matter in a way that makes them think about it in a different way. So, for example, um, you know, I could, uh, you know, cite statistics on civilian casualties, um, you know, of drone strikes or something like that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, talk about how uh, aggressive militarism um, on the U.S.'s part is, is, a, is a terrible thing in the world. Um, you know, or I could try and create an experience where some element of that is, is made is, is made present and, and the listener is made aware of that makes them think about that in a different way. Um, so, for example, uh, I wrote a piece for string quartet that uses uh, lighting, um, and some of the lighting is derived from different types of enhanced interrogation techniques, hmm. uh, specifically the use of very, very strong blasts of light um, in irregular intervals uh, to create a sense of regression um, in a detainee. So, um, in the in the realization in the piece, I mean, some people ask me like, "Well, are you torturing your audience? Is this mm -hmm. is this your intention?" And that's not my intention. But I do want that kind of visceral, uncomfortable feeling to be something that is part of their experience, which is different than reading about, um, you know, the horrific treatment of, uh, you know, uh, detainees at Abu Ghraib or at Guantanamo Bay. Um, and I think that if art has that kind of political function, um, at least as far as I'm concerned, it is to serve as a different way of thinking about an issue, um, which is bringing it into a place which is uh, different in experience than, um, than, than purely a kind of intellectual knowledge-based place. Um, as far as animal welfare is concerned, I've been thinking a lot about how that might influence my music, and I don't really have a good answer on that. Mm -hmm. I haven't really found a way to consciously integrate that uh, into my work. I think that um, one of the things that it really has done for me um, generally, but and seeps in my work in certain ways is, is thinking about a sense of, on the one hand, empathy um, for, uh, for things that aren't me, you know, whether they be human or non-human um, or whether they, uh, you know, be animate or inanimate. Um, and uh, also uh, for thinking about my connection to a much larger whole. Um, thinking about the way in which I, you know, as a person, as a part of my species, as a mammal, you know, et cetera, et cetera, kind of uh, zooming out how I interact with everything around me and how all of those decisions that I make on these sort of micro levels sort of play out into these much more larger holes. And maybe that has something to do with, you know, the way I think about music. Um, I'm, I'm not really sure. But um, I haven't really found any kind of discrete connections, but certainly um, in my way in which I kind of think about the world and the way in which I think about relationships between things, between myself and other things and between things outside of myself, um, I think the work um, in animal welfare has taught me a lot about that and taught me to be really sensitive to it. Mm. Excellent. Um, I'm, I'm curious if you're familiar um, with the musician David Rothenberg. No, <laughs> um, it's funny. I interviewed him a while back, and he uh, he's like a I don't know I don't know if he's a vegan or anything, but he regularly does like interspecies collaborations, which I think is kind of funny. Like he collaborates with cicadas. <laughs> he has m multiple albums where it's him playing with cicadas, or like him playing with whales or birds or whatever. It's kind of a funny uh, you know take on the same sort of question. Um, but it's a little bit out there, but, uh, you know, just curious if you're aware of them. No, I'll have to check that out. Um, you know, just environmental stimuli, um, in the oral dimension to me is, is, is incredibly fascinating. Uh, one of my favorite things in life to do is to sit under the trees and, um, watch wind pass through them, um, uh, and listen to the sound of those leaves interacting, um, it's, it's sort of, uh, in a way, a kind of microcosm for me of, of, of one of these systems that's being, you know, one of these self-organizing systems. 
um, that that's really immediate um, and is is complex, uh, but is self contained enough for me to um, you know to get a strong read on it um, in, a, in a in a real time real life way. Um, and those kinds of sort of micro interactions kind of creating a much larger whole, you know, the single cicada versus, um, you know, a, a whole horde of them, um, mm -hmm. you know, is, is related to that, I think. And um, those ways in which, you know, I see myself as a part of all of that, um, perhaps as, as Mr. Rothenberg does, um, you know, is, uh, is something that is really fascinating and inspiring to me. Very cool. Well, um, this has been a great conversation. I've really enjoyed speaking with you. Um, is there anything else you want to say before we sign off? Um, I don't think so. I mean, um, it's been really great to talk to to talk to you, um, and it's been really interesting to learn of our overlaps and everything from animal rights issues to to metal to microtonality. So um, I'm very happy to have met such a kindred spirit. <laughs> yeah, likewise. And um, I'll, I'll put some links to um, various performances of your music that I uh, particularly enjoy, but also, um, you know, should go uh, out there that your scores are on your website and that you're just asking uh, whatever one can donate to, um, I forget the organization, but um, I thought that that was a, a nice sentiment. Um, yeah, so... Yeah, it's 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 an animal shelter that um, um, where I volunteer. So um, you know, uh, none of this money goes to me. Um, I don't even see what the donations are. It just goes straight to their to their web page. Um, and you know, that donation can be zero if if that's where if that's where you're at. But you know, if you can just throw in a, th a few bucks, um, it it really it really does add up and help. Um, right now, um, I work particularly with dog rescue, and um, you know, right now adoption levels and um, uh, income are really, really down. Um, so uh, anything that you can do to help, um, you know, in terms of donations, in terms of uh, volunteering, or especially in terms of adopting, um, I really, really encourage you to look into that because it's, it's a wonderfully rewarding and, and beautiful thing to do. Awesome. Well, well, Jason Eckhart, thanks so much for talking. I will talk to you in the future. Thanks so much. It's been my pleasure. Talk to you later.